Fifty years ago, on April the 29th, a group of far-sighted people in this country got together to warn the world of an impending disaster. Among them were a distinguished scientist, Sir Julian Huxley, a bird-loving painter, Peter Scott, an advertising executive, Guy Mountford, and a powerful and astonishingly effective civil servant, Max Nicholson, and several others. They were all, in addition to their individual professions, dedicated naturalists, fascinated by the natural world, not just in this country, but internationally. And they noticed what few others had done, that all over the world, charismatic animals that were once numerous were beginning to disappear. The Arabian oryx, which had once been widespread all over the peninsula, had been reduced to a few hundred. In Spain, there were only about 90 imperial eagles left. The Californian condor was down to about 60. In Hawaii, a goose that had once lived in flocks around the lava fields of the great volcanoes had been reduced to 50. And the strange little rhinoceros that lived in the dwindling forests of Java to about 40. These were the most extreme examples. But wherever naturalists look, they found that species of animals were populations that were falling rapidly. This planet was in danger of losing a significant number of its inhabitants, both animals and plants. Something had to be done. The world awoke to conservation. Millions, billions of dollars were raised. And yet now, in spite of a great number of individual successes, the problem seems bigger than ever. More species at risk of extinction than ever before. Why? 50 years ago, there were about 3 billion people on Earth. Now, there are almost 7 billion, over twice as many, and every one of them needing space. Space for their homes, space to grow their food, or get others to grow it for them, space to build schools and roads and airfields. Where could that come from? A little might be taken from land occupied by other people, but most of it could only come from the land which, for millions of years, animals and plants had had to themselves, the natural world. All these people in this country and worldwide, rich or poor, need and deserve food, water, energy and space. Will they be able to get it? I don't know. I hope so. Consider food. Very few of us here, I suspect, have ever experienced real hunger. For animals, of course, it's a regular feature of their lives. The stoical desperation of the cheetah cubs whose mother failed in her last few attempts to kill prey for them and who consequently faced starvation is very touching. But that happens to human beings too. All of us who've traveled in poor countries have met people for whom hunger is a daily background ache in their lives. There are about a billion such people today. It remains an obvious and brutal fact that on a finite planet, human populations will quite definitely stop at some point. And that can only happen in one of two ways. It can happen sooner by fewer human births, in a word, by contraception. That's the humane way, the powerful option which allows all of us to deal with the problem if we collectively choose to do so. The alternative is an increased death rate, the way in which all other creatures must suffer through famine or disease or predation. That, translated into human terms, means famine or disease or war over oil or water or food or minerals or grazing rights or just living space. If you have contacts in government, ask why the growth of our population, which affects every department, is yet no one's responsibility. The Hawaiian goose, the oryx, the imperial eagle, which sounded the environmental alarm 50 years ago, were, you might say, 
the equivalent of canaries in coal mines, warnings of impending and even wider catastrophe. Make a list of all the other environmental problems that now afflict us and our poor, battered planet. The increase of greenhouse gases and consequential global warming, the acidification of the oceans and the collapse of fish stocks, the loss of the rainforests, the spread of deserts, the shortage of arable land, the increase in violent weather, the growth of megacities, famine, migration patterns, the list goes on and on. But they all share one underlying cause. Every one of these global problems, social as well as environmental, becomes more difficult and ultimately impossible to solve with ever more people.